All right, my research paper was on nutrients and strategies to improve nocturia. And we'll start by defining what nocturia is, first of all. If you break it up into its words, noct and urea, kind of as it sounds, nocturnal and urine. So it's defined as the need to awaken one or more times in the middle of the night to urinate. And this is actually quite a big problem. It's considered to be one of the most prevalent and troublesome lower urinary tract symptoms, which we'll call glutes going forward, just a quicker way to say it. But a lot of men, especially older men, have this problem where they wake up in the middle of the night because they have to urinate. And if it happens at least once, it's considered nocturia, but two or more episodes, it becomes very prevalent in men over the age of 40. And it's significant in men more than women when you're talking about two or more times. It actually, I was surprised to learn, occurs almost equally in men and women if you're talking about just waking up once. But if you're talking about multiple episodes, and if you're talking about the older population, then it is more prevalent in men. And as a matter of fact, up to 62% of men between the ages of 70 and 80 years old experience two or more nocturnal episodes per night. And by 90 years old, as many as 90% of men are going to have some kind of a lower urinary, lower urinary tract symptom, such as nocturia. So... One of the reasons why we may find that this is more prevalent in men than women is because of prostatic enlargement, which may be driven by inflammation in many cases. And of course, waking up in the middle of the night, it sounds like it can have a big negative impact, but I guess you could say the magnitude of how negative this can be, I think is sometimes underestimated. Uh, so first of all, healing happens when we sleep. And so if we're constantly waking up in the middle of the night, then our body's healing capacity will be greatly diminished. And then when you have sleep deprivation, you're not focused during your day, it can affect personal relationships. And they actually find that hip fractures and falls becomes extremely common as a result of nocturia. And it actually has a pretty big economic burden um, because of all the money that's then spent towards the hip fracture repairs. So we'll talk about how is this diagnosed? Well, <laughs> simply if the client or if the individual is um, complaining that they are waking up in the middle of the night to urinate, then we can start there. But it's also really important to identify the root cause of um, why this is happening. So some examples of some root causes that could make it so that a client is waking up in the middle of the night to urinate could be blood sugar dysregulation disorders such as diabetes, um, elevated insulin levels, metabolic syndrome. It could also be from abnormal or increased secretion of anabolic hormones such as growth hormone or insulin-like growth factor, also known as IGF. Could be from an impaired diurnal rhythm or secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Could be from hypertension or high blood pressure. It could be from increased um, medications that cause you to urinate more, such as diuretics or high blood pressure medications in some cases as well. Um, this could also be from prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate, BH or BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, and possibly in some cases it could be um, from cancer. So a lot of these pathologies that I just listed have connections and relationships with one another. So just as an example, if you have elevated insulin levels, that can actually stimulate your liver to produce more IGF, which then decreases apoptosis, which is cell death, and it can stimulate um, prostatic growth, and it could lead to BPH or nocturia. So a lot of these issues that I just listed off, they are connected and they do overlap. Everything in the body is always connected. Now, a little anatomy uh, lesson here. So the prostate actually lies just below the bladder and it surrounds the urethra, which is the basically the tube that the urine flows out of. And so if you have inflammation to the prostate, then it can directly contribute to nocturia because 
it can compress the bladder and reduce the um, urine capacity, um, holding the urine holding capacity of the bladder. So, you know, if someone is waking up constantly in the middle of the night, first we should rule out obvious factors like are they drinking a gallon of water before bed or are they taking a diuretic before bed? Um, so after, you know, assessing the obvious causes, if, you know, if those are not the, the causes, then let's dig a little deeper and see what's going on. So we can do a urinalysis and that can be done to check for the presence of an infection like bacteria that might be causing prostatitis and inflamed prostate. We can check the blood and the urine glucose levels to see what the HbA1c levels are, um, fasted glucose, and that can help us to see if maybe diabetes is contributing. A biopsy could check for the presence of prostate cancer. The digital rectal exam or the PSA are common tests that are used um, to check for an, alar an enlarged prostate, but these tests are not the end-all be-all. They do have some error that's um, prone to them. So for an example, the PSA is not specific for cancer. It can also be elevated from infection or trauma or inflammation. So now I want to talk a little bit about the role of dairy and prostate inflammation and cancer. So there has been a lot of research that's linked dairy, specifically the insulin-like growth factor that's found in the dairy um, that is then um, put into our bodies. There's a lot of research between that and prostate cancer and other cancers. Uh, but when I was searching the literature for you know, the studies of the IGF and dairy consumption and nocturia, there wasn't a whole lot of research that came up. One study found no correlation between dairy consumption and urination frequency, but there was research that does suggest that it may be a risk factor if you're consuming dairy, moderate amounts maybe, or obviously high amounts, may, may be a risk factor for nocturia, and I'll explain why. So there was a national health survey that found a relationship between IGF-1 and um, insulin growth factor binding protein and lower urinary tract symptoms. So basically what they found was that men that had increased LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms, um, showed higher levels of IGF-1 circulating in their blood and lower levels of insulin-like growth factor binding protein 3. So let me explain what that means. So IGF-1 has been shown to inhibit apoptosis, you know, and um, like I previously mentioned, and increase prostatic tissue proliferation and growth. So that's IGF-1. It's been shown to basically lead to this growth in the prostate tissue. But then IGF-BP3 has been shown to block IGF-1 um, possibly, you know, from binding to the sites. And basically what IGF-BP3 has the potential to do is have anti-proliferative and protective effects in the prostate. So what that study found was that those that are consuming high dairy basically are going to have um, high dairy gives higher IGF-1, possibly more proliferation, more tissue growth in the prostate, more inflammation in the prostate. So other research has found a dose-dependent relationship between milk consumption and dairy consumption and the resulting concentration of IGF-1 in the blood. So given that, it is plausible that milk and dairy consumption may be a contributing factor to the development of nocturia, although it would be great if more research could be done in this area. Now, diabetes is considered to be a risk factor for nocturia. There have been studies that have found that there's a significant independent positive risk factor or positive correlation between diabetes and nocturia. So elevated insulin levels are suggested to do a couple of things. Um, first, it's suggested that they'll increase sympathetic nerve stimulation in the prostate and increase the prostatic smooth muscle tone. And also, insulin is suggested to enlarge prostate size owing to its anabolic properties. So insulin is actually structurally similar to IGF, which we just mentioned. And the insulin might bind to these IGF receptors in the prostate and then cause growth in the prostate tissue and proliferation. Uh, another thing that can lead to nocturia would be increased inflammation and increased oxidative stress. 
there was a study that was done with over 8,000 men um, between age 50 and 75, and they found a statistically significant association between chronic inflammation and levels of, it's called IPSS, which stands for International Prostate Symptom Scores. And so basically greater levels of chronic inflammation was associated with um, greater lutes or low urinary, lower urinary tract symptoms. And again, nocturia is an example of a lutes. Um, hypertension, another thing that's been suggested to be a risk factor for nocturia by many studies. So there's many things that may be involved here, but individuals that are on antihypertensive medications may be at high risk of nocturia because of the medications themselves, particularly, um, you know, when we talk about hypertension medications, we have different classes. We have ACE inhibitors, we have calcium channel blockers, diuretics, and beta blockers. Those are some of the most common. So there was a recent study that just came out, um, you know, less than a year ago, and it reviewed uh, 132, so this was um, a systematic review. So it looked at 132 different studies on antihypertensive medications, and they found that calcium channel blockers and loop diuretics specifically worsened lower urinary tract symptoms. And what I found interesting was that most of those studies were on loop diuretics and calcium channel blockers, and there were only six studies that discussed how ACE inhibitors um, might impact the nocturia or lower urinary tract symptoms. So more research would be great in this topic, but I you know, did a little bit of um, digging into this topic myself. And even though there's opposing viewpoints, it, it could be that these ACE inhibitors um, are contributing to nocturia in some cases. First of all, ACE inhibitors and thiazide diuretics have been known to deplete zinc. We're going to talk about how zinc is very, very important for prostate health, and zinc deficiencies have been shown to contribute to BPH-related nocturia. And so maybe this is why um, people with hypertension have an increased risk for nocturia, because if they're on these medications, maybe it's leading to other negative downstream effects. Beta blockers and other diuretics have been known to cause poor blood sugar control and increase insulin resistance, which we just talked about how that may be contributing to nocturia. So just, you know, some food for thought. Well, the research still needs to be done. Um, now, just to touch on some of the biochemical mechanisms that are involved here. So ACE inhibitors stands for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And so this um, enzyme is responsible con for converting the hormone angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And that then stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. And it also, um, angiotensin 2, also stimulates the hypothalamus to produce antidiuretic hormone. Now, both of these hormones, both ADH and aldosterone, they both serve the purpose of water retention in the body. So when you have this ACE inhibitor that's inhibiting that from happening, um, then you get more water excreted from the body, and when you have you know, more water being excreted, it can lower blood pressure. So that's kind of the, the mechanism at play here. But you know, something to note about ADH is um, antidiuretic hormone is that in a normal person, it should increase overnight, and that would then lead to a decreased urinary production, which makes sense. We don't want to be peeing all the time in the middle of the night. We want our body to rest and heal and repair. Now, those with nocturia might have, sometimes they do actually have, um, an impaired circadian secretion of ADH. So whereas most people, the ADH should increase overnight, theirs may not increase as much. It may be blunted, and it may be leading to them constantly having to wake up and pee. And so this is important to know because we have to understand why is this nocturia happening? Is it from inflammation? Is it from poor blood sugar regulation? Or is it from an impaired diurnal secretion of ADH? So another thing to always keep in mind with any um, pathology or any disease state is that the body does have this built-in hardwired mechanism to find homeostasis. So sometimes when we're taking a drug, um, you know, this drug might be interfering with our body's attempt to bring homeostasis, and it can basically throw a monkey wrench, is the phrase I like to use, into the body system, which can then cause a lot of negative downstream imbalances. 
So for example, here, if we are throwing this um, hypertension medication in, it may mess with the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, known as the ROS system, or renin-angiotensin-ADH system, and causing these imbalances may contribute to nocturia, um, which is kind of my, my conclusions um, from what I've read. So if possible, finding a way to lower blood pressure with dietary and lifestyle interventions would be preferred. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, diabetes because I want to talk about some of the dietary and lifestyle factors that could contribute to the pathogenesis of nocturia. So when you have excess calories, um, that can for sure contribute to diabetes, which can then, and excess sugar specifically, and poor blood sugar control from not enough protein. You know, poor sleep habits can also contribute to nocturia. Um, and something important to make sure of is that we're moderating our light exposure. So if we are not getting enough sunlight early in the day and getting too much bright light exposure at night, then that could lead to uh, an imbalanced secretion of melatonin. And melatonin is really key for allowing our body to get in deep sleep. And so it's important to pay attention to these things so that we're, we're basically having the proper diurnal secretion of the hormones um, because those with nocturia have been found to have impaired melatonin secretion and lower melatonin levels overnight. Um, when, we, when we talk about inflammation, it's really important to keep our omega-6 to 3 ratio in check. So for example, the average American um, tends to have an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 20 to 1, whereas what we should have for optimal health is closer to 3 to 1 or 1 to 1. So when our levels of inflammation get out of check, that can lead to nocturia. So let's talk about some nutrients that can improve nocturia. So phytonutrients have been shown to be very therapeutic in restoring our hypothalamic function, which the hypothalamus is what secretes ADH. So phytonutrients have been shown from plants, have been shown to be therapeutic in so many different things. Um, also polyphenols, you know, have been shown to be, to be very beneficial in improving insulin resistance and to improving blood sugar control. When we talk about increasing our omega-3s, um, that's also important to reduce oxidative stress by increasing our total antioxidant capacity and increasing glutathione peroxidase levels. Zinc is a big one for prostate health. Um, it has been shown to yield proper formation of prostatic fluid and help with apoptosis of pro prostate cells, which in this case is beneficial so that we don't get this overgrowth and things like BPH and um, prostate cancer. So interestingly, studies have shown that prostate zinc levels are less than 50% in those with BPH, and so depleted zinc might be contributing to um, BPH-induced nocturia. So I have in my paper the levels of all of the different micronutrients and the RDAs and what's suggested. So if anyone is interested in that, then you can, you can let me know. Um, but there are several other nutrients that can help with uh, nocturia. Lycopene, found in tomatoes most notably, but also found in watermelon, tomatoes, and grapefruit. Lycopene has been shown to inhibit insulin-like growth factor and other growth factor signaling pathways and in reduce inflammatory cytokine expression. Um, saw palmetto and beta-cytosterol. Beta-cytosterol has been shown to induce apoptosis and inhibit inflammatory growth of the prostate. Um, through manipulating the enzyme 5 alpha reductase, which then serves to reduce dihy dihydrotestosterone and therefore um, reduce prostate enlargement. So, there have been some studies that have shown that um, a combination of beta cytosterol, lycopene boron, in this um, Africanum bark extract and melatonin um, supplementation for 60 days in males significantly improved nocturia. Um, as a matter of fact, I want to say that there was a 64% decrease in the um, number of times that, or in the participants waking up one or more times in the middle of the night to urinate. So that's, that's pretty good stuff right there. Uh, melatonin has been shown to be therapeutic in many trials. 
Um, something to keep in mind is that we can boost our body's endogenous production of melatonin by ensuring adequate tryptophan, which is an amino acid found in proteins, um, B6, which is found in poultry and fish, uh, folate found in leafy greens, and magnesium and zinc. All of those things are needed to produce melatonin. Another thing to note is that, you know, if we're eating these things, that's one thing, but if we're absorbing them, that's what's really important. So sometimes it might be good to get a micronutrient test so that way, or um, just get different blood levels ran, such as, you know, testing red blood cell count or MCV um, to see if you have perhaps megaloblastic anemia, which might indicate you have a folate or a B12 deficiency because even if you're consuming adequate amounts, different genetic differences, um, and if you're on certain medications such as proton pump inhibitors, which keeps the stomach from being able to properly digest proteins and um, certain nutrients, then that could mean that you know we have to correct some other things or we might need to supplement in some cases. Um, one person might need to supplement more than the other based on these things. Um, so really the best thing for someone with, um, with nocturia would really be let's, let's hone in on the diet and let's make sure we're not consuming excess sugar. Let's look at the milk, um, maybe cutting that out um, if the person is consuming milk, and let's consume a balanced diet. So an example of a balanced diet could be five cups of um, fruits and veggies per day at minimum would be recommended. That's what a lot of studies find. Daily movement. Um, getting a high quality protein source in each meal. And I emphasize quality because we don't want to put pro-inflammatory, um, poor quality protein sources in our body that would um, possibly make it worse. Um, and then uh, making sure we're you know, getting enough diversity in our diet to get a diversity of foods. Um, it's something also to note is if someone is vegetarian, it, it could lead to some issues uh, that they're not getting enough B vitamins, that they may not be getting enough zinc because the vegetarian diet, even though there is zinc in nuts and seeds and vegetarian foods, it's also high in anti-nutrients, so that could keep that zinc from being absorbed properly. So by com combining good sleep habits with these supplements and a good diet first and foremost and daily movement, um, then the person will likely find a lot of benefit and a lot of relief and getting some blood work after, you know, let's say some baseline blood work, but then after three months following up, testing things like the HbA1c, the fasted blood glucose, um, cholesterol levels, white blood cell counts, and inflammatory marker, markers like high sensitivity CRP and doing a zinc tally test. Um, those can be really great ways, in addition to seeing how many times the person is waking up in the middle of the night to urinate, uh, really great ways to assess the progress. Thank you for listening to my presentation on Nocturia. Hope you enjoyed.